Uh, I covered Richard Nixon for much of the presidential campaign in 1968. Um, and I sort of got my first hint about what kind of a campaigner uh, he was because I had just read Teddy White's book, and indeed I, I had it with me, his famous book, The Making of the Presidency, or The Making of the President, 1960, which of course was when Nixon ran for um, president against uh, Jack Kennedy and was defeated. Um, and because I had the book with me and was reading it while we were on the campaign, something struck me that would not otherwise have struck me. We were. We were campaigning somewhere outside Detroit, Michigan. And uh, the, everything about the Nixon campaign, especially in 68, was rigidly organized, to the point that uh, it was as close to heaven for the press as you can get. Uh, our bags would always be picked up in the morning from outside our rooms. They would always be standing in front of our rooms uh, when we got to the next place that night. There was always good food on the plane or on the bus. Uh, Nixon took every weekend off in Florida and stayed with his old friend Bibi Rebozo, which meant that we had the weekend off in Florida, uh, and that was good. Um, and uh, you, you didn't expect anything unexpected from the Nixon campaign. Everything was rigidly programmed. So it was really curious on this, on this one morning as we were driving outside Detroit that Nixon's motorcade stopped. And it stopped in front of a school for the deaf. And a number of people from the school for the deaf came out, gathered around Nixon, who was standing on the hood of his car. Uh, and as stupid as it sounds, he had a bullhorn uh, with, with which he told these deaf youngsters, that he had had an aunt who was deaf, and that he had always been very much impressed by her, and he spoke about this aunt, and that it was the memory of the aunt that caused him, when he saw the sign for the school, to order his motorcade to come to a stop. And he just wanted to talk to them for a few minutes uh, to tell them what a wonderful woman his aunt had been and how he was sure that they would all turn into wonderful men and women too and lead useful and productive lives. And with that, he handed the bullhorn to an aide, got back in the car, and we started rolling again. And I thought, geez, that sounds familiar. And I pull out my, my 1960 campaign book by Teddy White, and sure enough, he had stopped in front of the same damn school for the deaf and given them verbatim the same little speech, unrehearsed, unprepared. Uh, and so that, of course, was the, the essence of my story that night. But Nixon was a very, very bright man who simply could not handle uh, anything ad lib, small talk. He was very poor at small talk. He had come on the program long after his presidency. He came on Nightline uh, after Brezhnev, Leonid Brezhnev, um, who had been the Secretary General of the Soviet Communist Party after he died. And we'd had a couple, two or three ex-presidents, ex-secretaries of state on the program. The program went very late, and I didn't get home until about 4 in the morning. Uh, went to bed. My wife is an attorney. She was off when the phone rang the next morning. She was already at work. The kids were at school, but it was about quarter to eight. And I hear this very familiar voice on the phone saying, Hold, Ted, President Nixon here. And I said, uh, Good morning, Mr. President. What can I do for you? And the first words out of his mouth were, I didn't realize you got up this early. And the first thought that goes through my head is, well, why are you calling me, you numbskull, if you didn't think that I'd got up this early? But uh, that was just sort of quintessential Nixon, that um, as smart as he was, as brilliantly as he could, as he could expostulate on 
foreign policy, domestic policy, a man with a brilliant memory, knew the name of not just every county chairman, Republican county chairman, but every Republican county chairman's wife and probably all of their kids. Really a smart guy, but couldn't handle small talk. And it just made him uncomfortable to be around because unless you got right into the interview with him or asked him immediately what you wanted to know, if you were trying to make a little bit of small talk, you were going nowhere.